a smooth operator, I'm a smooth operator. Tri 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 Trill sessions. Let's crack on. Fire question. Coke or Pepsi chaps? Pepsi. Uh, Coke Zero. Question two. One driver on a hot lap to save humanity. Who are you going with, Max or Lewis? Lewis. Lewis. Clark or Fangio? I'd have to go Clark. I'm going to go Clark because Steve went Clark. Don't disagree. Schumacher or Senna? Senna. Senna. Spa or Silverstone? Spa oh, was my first Grand Prix I went to. Uh, Silverstone was mine, so uh, I'll keep... Uh, I love Spa. I love Eau Rouge. But it's got to be Silverstone. The original Grand Prix, 1948, wasn't it? Where the first one ever took place. So. Go on then, Al Pacino or De Niro? Oh, De Niro. I'm going to go Al Pacino. Godfather 1 or Godfather 2? Two. 1. 2. Biggie or Pat? Chaps. 2 Pat, I think. It's Biggie all day for me. Jay-Z or Nas? Jay-Z. Yeah, Jay-Z. Rihanna or Beyonce? Beyonce. See, I, I've got a thing. Early Rihanna, I just remember sort of like just sort of dancing across a dance floor or something. But Blur or Oasis? Oasis. Oasis. One album to listen to for the rest of your life? Howl Jam's versus album. And he's going to go Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. It wasn't his first album. I think it was his second one, Will Smith. Um, you <laughs> <laughs> All right, then one song to listen to for the rest of your life. I'll take over, Jay-Z. Beastie Boys, Sabotage. Nando's or KFC? Nando's. Nando's. You're on death row. Your final meal is? Actually, we can have whatever we want, can't we? So I'll probably have a curry, a lasagna, <laughs> and a Black Forest gatto. I might as well die and gorge myself on food. It's pizza all day. I love that. That, that ends our quick fire round. I think you've I think you've had an MVP showing there, Steve, with your last dancer. Black gatto, <laughs> black forest gatto. Yes, man. Bloody normal. Do not do Jeez. not do not fuck with the black forest gatto, man. Tell us who Andy and Steve are when they're at home away from Lucky Sun. Oh, I'll go first. I'll tell you, my, I'm probably pretty miserable. <laughs> No, <laughs> my, my kids, my, my kids just walk around the house sort of looking at it, sort of assessing what my mood is, whether or not I'm happy or if I'm sort of like stressed or angry, right? And which sounds which sounds horrible, but basically, I'm a father of three, 13, 14, and, uh, and a 16 year old, happily married with a smoking hot Italian wife. Um, I have a dog. I think I was exaggerating with the sort of the mood swings and everything, but um, I'm quite, I'm a very simple person. I exercise, I still like to play 11 or so football on a Saturday, go at it hard because I still think I'm a Brian Robson or a Roy Keane type of player, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm nowhere near that. The reality is I panic when I'm on the ball. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Um, I think the long and short of it is I'm, a, I'm actually quite a simple person. Quite like, I just like the simple things now. You know what? What's quite coincidental or whatever it might be, Andy and I went to school together. So we've known each other for a, quite a long time. We actually had a first job together at a really shit pub in Kent. And we ended up about a year ago living on exactly the same street without even knowing it. We knew, we, we'd, we'd see each other around and walk our dogs together. But, but at home, because I've, I've run my own design and brand agency for fucking years, like 23 years. So I've always kind of worked remotely. Everyone I work with is working remotely. I've got two kids as well, uh, two dogs, two cockapoos, Bob and Barney, uh, a wife who tolerates me, a 10-year-old daughter and a 17-year-old son who is uh, probably supposed to be studying for his A-levels but will definitely be on his PS5 at the moment. Fairly ordinary in everyday walk of life. People definitely end up having to walk around eggshells for me because I'm. they'll know the minute they open the front door. Everyone knows pretty much if I've had a really good day or a typical day, which is is managing all of that and trying to get an F1 team up and running. Let's get into uh, to Lucky Sons. Just give us a quick overview on what Lucky Sons is and what your overall mission is for Formula One and motorsport in general. Um, so what is, what is Lucky Sons and the overall mission? The overall mission is essentially to, to bring in talent that doesn't currently have access to the sport. And, and the reasons for that is is quite simply because it's wrong that the, the opportunities aren't there. And for me personally, as much as Steve is the real creative, I love creativity. And I think the more the different types of people that you've got in any kind of life, in any uh, work environment or, or friend environment or whatever, the more the different cultures that come, it's just, a, it's just a hell of a lot more fun and a lot more creative. So, <clears throat> so from when setting up Lucky Sons as, as, as we've done, it was, a lot of it was for me it was based on, on pretty samey 
up and down the grid? How do we make that different? How do we make ourselves stand out? And it's, it's, it's the sort of the diversity of thought, it's the creativity. That was in line with our overall thinking of you know, putting a team in Asia. Why put a team in Asia? Because it's it's a market that really sort of Formula One dips its toes into and then takes it out pretty quickly. And then, you know, why Africa? Well, why, why not Africa? Africa deserves um, a team that it can identify with, that it can really get behind and, and cheer on because they know that they're in part of being, of being responsible for, for creating and building it. Um, so we just basically wanted to give access to different types of people because it's the right thing to do. I think businesses in general, the, the more diverse a business is, the more successful it can be. I think that's really important. This is where it gets techy with the, the real world F1 stuff because we all we understand what F1 is. We know it and love it, but it's it has its deficiencies as far as particularly around the diversity thing. Diversity shouldn't just be, shouldn't be a word that they just trot out to tick a box. Do you think in your heart of hearts, is F1 ready for divert, like true, proper diversity? <laughs> That is such an awful question <clears throat> to ask the Cameron from a, from somebody in our spot right now because I would say, and I've got to speak honestly about it, I don't think they were ready for a Lucky Sons in that I think that maybe we were just a bit too different for Formula One. Uh, regardless of what what happened in our in our in, in the bid process, I just think that we maybe scared them a little bit, and we were bringing bringing about too much change. You know, from our eyes, change is good, right? Change moves forward, thing uh, moves things forward. Nothing to be scared about being different or. or change is is the sport ready for it well i think if they if they were ready for it i think they had the perfect team for it i think the simple answer to that question is no having worked in advertising if you think that more than 70 over 75 percent of all consumer products bought are bought by women and there used to be it's improving now but there's less than five percent of the top creative directors are women so 75 percent of all of the products that are being sold to mainly women as a target audience the campaigns have been designed by men and i think formula one is quite similar in their attitude this is the pinnacle of motorsport It is a world championship with 10 teams, all of which predominantly are in Europe, with exceptions with Haas being having some facilities in the US. And seven of those teams are based in the UK, within about 50 miles radius of each other. And we know they're all struggling to actually do anything about diversity because they all fish in the same fucking talent pond. How long have you guys been been working towards this? You know, obviously we obviously the application process only started at the beginning of this year, but presumably this has been going on for years. So to Benjamin, uh, Benjamin Duran, I suppose he's the original original, right? Let's call him the OG. <laughs> I think it was sort of 2016, 2017, he started to try and set up China F1. Um, and then that sort of turned into Pantera Team Asia, uh, along with a gentleman called Michelle Orks. Um, sort of fast forward a couple of years and sort of 20, I want to say 2019 is when I came on board. So I've been on it four years, Benjamin's been on it six years. And we we, we, we took Pantera Team Asia up to a certain point. Um, and this is where I think, I can understand why people get confused about it but Lucky Suns isn't a rebrand of Pantera Team Asia so it was a completely separate entity I don't need to go into too much detail about it because obviously there's, there's nothing to nothing to make of it it was just a Pantera and Pantera or Benjamin decided to decided that he had different priorities and thought that sort of breaking <laughs> away from Pantera Team Asia was, was the way forward and, and myself as, lo- as well as Paul Fleming we, we weren't stakeholders in Pantera we, we were looking at the bigger picture obviously but we, we decided to move across with Benjamin and set up our own team or our own bid. Um, so I've so Benjamin's been on it for six years, I've been on it for four years, I think Paul's been on it for two or three. Um, one where you know we've all been, been been involved in this project to set up a new Formula One team one way or another for, for sort of between three three to six years. I completely understand kind of like, oh I've never heard of this thing before, they must be dodgy. But I think you know, before Facebook came along in 2009, nobody had ever heard of Facebook either. There is always things that are new that come along. And because we haven't come, we're not a road in, we're not a high tech, we aren't coming with cars in other series yet. And that immediately puts us as like, the, well, they're not serious. Well, we fucking are. Can I, can I pitch the name back at you? Because it's bonkers right now. I'm not a marketing 
guy, but I understand marketing 101 is that it's it's got to be simple and catchy and something that people can remember. What was the thinking behind coming up with a name that's so hard to remember and spell or type? Andy, you want me to go? Having worked in branding for 25 years, I have sat in so many fucking meetings where, for months, literally these meetings go on for fucking hours every day, people scratching their chins and pontificating over post-it notes. What actually happened was, Andy came to me and said, we need to change the name. And I was like, ooh, excellent. I put my branding hat on immediately in a nanosecond and thought, ooh, cool, we can do like some workshops. And Andy was like, yeah, we need to do it by tomorrow. So Andy and I genuinely had a WhatsApp group. And then I was like, fuck it, we need to put this into a Google Doc. We've got a Google Doc with all the other names. We literally, we didn't have time. And so Andy and I had this long, long list and we were arguing like bickering siblings. In the end, Andy chose Lucky Sons. So it's basically his fault, but it's Lucky Sons because luck is a big thing in, in Asia and Sons because the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, which is effectively what we will end up doing, traveling from the east to the west. So it really isn't any more complicated than that. And you know what? Whether people can pronounce it or not, they will eventually. And I quite like the fact that we, we don't plan on doing any deep dives into brand purposes and brand values and all that bullshit because it's not necessary. Octopus Energy is the biggest, UK's biggest energy company and I know for a fact that they didn't sit around for a long time thinking about the name, they just went, do you know what, I quite like the name Octopus, the investor from Australia had a company name that already and like, let's just keep it and they're now a five billion pound turnover company. So, you know, branding Branding can take an awful long time, or it can take 24 hours and a Google Doc. Can I just add to that something? And I, and I think, and I still, I giggle about this because, and I'll probably get slapped by, by Paul or Benjamin for saying this, but I think when, when the FIA sort of declared that Andretti was the only successful bidder, Steve and I put together a statement that we were going to um, going to upload him. <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and you've got to remember, we sort of him and I were working in my kitchen at the time, I think. And I've gone, and, and it, we've got the logo at the top of the statement. And it just says "Lucky Sun." And I was like, "How good would it be just to put un in front of that <laughs> and release it?" So it's unlucky sun. <laughs> I think the look, I think what you can take from this is that we have a hell of a lot of fun, and, and hopefully, you know, as sort of chaotic it might look, the sort of the creative chaos. That's what we want to get across. We don't have to be this corporate machine that does everything like everybody else. I don't think new brands today should be like that. It's a form of creative chaos. Yes. And we want that fun to come across to people. We have to affect, we have to bring out some some sort of emotion in people. And I think a lot of what sports teams, not just Formula One teams do today, I don't think evokes a lot of passion or a lot of excitement or a lot of, even just a giggle, right? At the end of the day, we all just want to be entertained by sport. And this is just our way of, our form of entertaining people, hopefully, in, in, in what we do and, and what we progress you know, further down the line. Step Andy, I think you've you've touched upon something that's really really important to bring out. And I know you you worked for Matchroom and and, and and events, and I'm a massive UFC fan. Dana White's kind of got this not combative approach to marketing, but he's he's kind of an open and he's open and honest in his in his disruption. And Andy, as you talk, you kind of that feels like that's what Lucky Sons is that you're open and honest in your disruption and you make no apology from that. Am I barking up the wrong tree? I think you're, you're definitely on the right path. I mean, Dana White, I mean, yeah, the, the guy has done amazing things with UFC and yeah, I'll, I'll listen to interviews with Dana White and I think yeah, he just says it how he sees it. And I think he, uh, he speaks his own truth. Um, he doesn't hide behind things. He's not worried. Now, whether or not you agree with it or not, okay, it doesn't matter, but I think we, we all need to respect honesty and, and people just speaking their truth. That's what we all do in Lucky Sons, Steve's, Steve particularly, you know, Benjamin and Paul. Paul's a very corporate individual, but he's also sort of really grabbing this by the by the ball as well. And, well, this is, you know, Lucky Sons allows me to say what I want to say because this is the right thing to do. We've just got to be honest with people. And I think when, when you're honest, you don't have to hide, you don't have to make things up, you don't, you know, you don't have to get tongue-tied down the line. Everybody should just be open and honest with everybody. And I don't, I don't think sports teams do enough of that. I think everybody's too media trained. 
because obviously you, you mentioned Dana White, Cameron. You've got to remember that I sat opposite, my desk was sat opposite the original Dana White, which is Barry Hearn. I did four, five, six years with, with Barry sitting opposite him. So I listened to everything that he would say, how he would say it, how he would conduct himself in interviews. Now I'm nervous as hell speaking on this right now, as I was speaking on the on the on the quick stop one. But I don't need to be nervous because I just need to speak the truth. And and so I effectively, you know, I learned from Barry Hearn. I didn't learn from Dana White. I still listen to Dana White, but Barry Hearn just taught me how to be myself. What does the process of applying for Formula One actually look like? So I'm the last person to want to hide behind. NDAs and things okay so this might work better instead of me running through it, it might just you know just sort of questioning me on certain parts of it but the long and short of it was was that it wasn't that simple to enter this process it, I don't think it was a case of anybody could have put a bid in at, at the very beginning when when Ben Sulliam opened up the expression of interest yes you could you could put your interest in but you had to follow that up with a $20,000 yeah, payment which you wouldn't get back if you decided not to go through with the full bid and once you put that expression of interest in you still got to then forward company details cover no various uh, you know accountancy things where they would then sort of deem whether or not you were a fit and proper person to where where they would essentially that they would ultimately allow you to then enter the actual formal process of the application once they've approved you on that phase of it then they'll send you an application form of which you need to I suppose ultimately fill out but your bid couldn't just be based on the answer to those application forms. You had to you had to supply other other documents and other sort of a business plan essentially. And then when you put everything together and you you feel that you've satisfied all the requirements that the FIA want you to satisfy, like your technical abilities, like where's the money coming from, like um, your EDI, your sustainability, the value that you're bringing to the sport, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You put that in and follow that up with a two hundred eighty thousand dollar payment. And at that point, you're in the process. You've applied, and from then on, there's a few questions that are fired back and forth, and and, and and that's that's basically it. Now, you know, in terms of going into real detail, yeah, I could I could I could talk about that process for, for hours and hours. But I don't mind the occasional slaps. So I don't mind getting into trouble. <laughs> um, but obviously. At the same time, you know, ultimately, we do want to continue to work with the FIA in some form down the road. So um, I don't want to upset how it would be too much, if you know what I mean. Andy, I want, I want, I want you to talk to the, the rounds of funding that you've been through, uh, and just, just so that people can get an understanding of the cachet and the financial backing that you've got behind you to make Lucky Sun sustainable. Yeah. You know, it's quite quite interesting, right? So we, we let's let's rewind it a little bit to when Benjamin first started this, whereby you know six years ago the idea of somebody putting in a new Formula One team was completely sort of you go and approach somebody and ask them for X amount of money, they're like, well, can it even happen in the first instance? And you've got to go through that sort of you know twisting people's arms process. And then the, the closer that we got to so January this year, we just found that doors were beginning to open that we'd sort of tried to kick down previously because there was obviously rumblings with Andretti wanting to open up the process, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then as soon as Ben Suleim drops the announcement, and I think it was January the second, I was on a train, I was coming back from a football match with my eldest. Yeah, you know, I get I get the message from the from the sort of the management WhatsApp group. He'd open the process up or something along those lines. Those doors that we were trying to kick down, all of a sudden, these people were chasing us. Um, are you going to go ahead with this? Uh, can we speak? You know, it was li- it was literally, you know, we, we we could we almost couldn't deal with the amount of people that were approaching us to to see if they to see if they could get involved with with what we were doing at the time. We had this we had this US based sports fund called Legend Sports Advocates, and they were typically most people were speaking about the money and the returns, etc. They were really really dead keen on what our plans were in Asia how we were going to roll things out in Africa. They were coming into it the right intentions. Of course, money people want to make money, but there are money people out there nowadays that actually want to do the right thing as well for the same time. And so obviously this process with, with Legend Sports Advocates you know, got to the point where it was agreed that they would then finance the the team once we'd got the license. They really put their cock on the block, and they Legend Sports Advocates are basically sort of a it's a network of family offices and, and very very wealthy sports stars. Some of the names that invest in uh, Legends is um, uh, activities are very very. When you when I say big names, you think the biggest names. 
and, and they're the guys that are sort of that are partnering with legends on on a lot of their lot of their activity in, in various different ways. It could be it could be drinks businesses, it could be hotel resorts, it could be property, but it it is also sport as well. And so we got to the point where they become our partner, and they are supported by institutional um, bank house banking houses, um, and I can't name those names, but there's probably you know there are the obvious names, and if you if you know the banking sector, you can probably be able to identify it, and and that's basically what it is you, what we need to remember as well is okay and i think this is the case for all the bidders nobody comes in and says right yeah um how much budget you need oh we need 600 million oh here's 600 million we're going to deposit in the account now okay so no we we've got commitments for 600 million once you get the license you can start drawing down that's the same across the board that would have been the same with high tech i imagine that probably would have been the same with Brody carlin would have been the same with andretti etc etc that's how it works in this type of scenario um, you don't suddenly get the money deposited in your bank account it's when when the license is dropped, that's when the drawdown starts because you've got X amount of people willing to commit X amount of hundreds of millions of dollars into the into the business. Why should FIA farm select a Lucky Sons over an Andretti Global or a high tech? So we're not in competition with Andretti per se, right? There was there was twelve teams, or there's, there's, there was two spaces. We all we went into it with our eyes wide open. We always fully expected Andretti to be given it because at the end of the day, he, he's the one that did us a favour, and he's the one that sort of opened up the process for everybody else to get involved. So I'm not against Andretti again. In fact, I hope Andretti now gets it um, because I think this sort of political back and forth between Formula One and the FIA, I think it's a really strange scenario to be in. If you open up the process for a new Team, then this this all needs to have been cleared up from that yeah, before the process even started, and I don't like the idea of anybody entering in this bid process um, and then ultimately nobody coming out of the other end with a license. I think it's wrong, and I think obviously Andretti will feel like that as well because he's he's the one that's made it to the final phase and that's now got to have the discussions with uh, with the Formula One group. So I think you know we always accepted that Andretti was going to get the eleventh spot, but obviously there was a twelfth spot, and I think that Formula One does a really good job of looking over in America at the moment. And I think we look at it as in, America's obviously a big market, it's an interesting market, it's exciting, but at the same time, is it gonna, at what point is it gonna plateau? Or what, or at what point is it gonna level out? And I think we're dangerously close to that. Um, at which point, where should the sport look in the next few years? And it's only natural that the sport would make a bigger commitment to Asia. But then, what the fuck, what's wrong with Africa? Yeah, we, we all know that Africa wants a Grand Prix. We all know Formula One wants a Grand Prix, but can you imagine how much that easier that that process would be easier to get a Grand Prix finally up and running in Africa? It doesn't have, just have to be South Africa. What about Kenya, Ghana, Zimbabwe, you know, Nigeria? And I think that process of getting a Grand Prix in Africa becomes a lot easier when there's a team where the citizens of that continent has a team that they can identify with, and it's the same with Asia. Then it's the same with Asia, you know. Would, I'm sure if you ask anybody, a diehard of Formula One, would they like to see the Malaysian Grand Prix back? I'm sure undoubtedly 99% would probably say yes. But Malaysia, it wants a Grand Prix. We know that because we've had serious discussions with the Malaysian government, but they just think it's too expensive. Now, does it become too expensive if, if there's a team based in Malaysia really getting the, the locals you know, revved up about Formula One again? So I just think <coughs> that was where we were coming from. Everybody's looking west, we were looking east. And I think that's really where I think the sports missed the trick by just putting one team through to the third phase of the process and not looking at sort of a lucky sons, thinking what they can do for the future of the sport. I think that there's a really important point. There's a lot of talk about sustainability and it's become a bit of a greenwash, you know, word. People use it, you know, again, like a policy on their website. Oh, we're sustainable. Sustainability to a lot of people is something with a logo with green leaves on it or a planet or a picture of a forest. Sustainability is also about economy. You know, Benjamin made a really good point. You know, whilst some teams were omnipresent on the uh, grid walks at certain Grand Prix, we have boots on the ground. We're, we're not just naming, listing countries for the sake of it. We've actually got, you know, uh, people in, in Thailand who are working with us uh, in discussions with those governments. Those conversations have been had, they're ongoing. We've had people uh, across, you know, Zimbabwe, Nigeria and Kenya with all of the local motorsport federation, which is part of the FIA, with all of their support. This isn't, this isn't a fucking pipe dream. This isn't... Um, you know, three white co-founders of the new Formula One team saying, oh yeah, we're going to do this with a view to, oh, we'll get the license and then fuck it, we'll just get a factory in uh, Milton Keynes. No, 
why Andretti over Lucky Sons? No, that, as Andy said, I'm pleased. I do genuinely hope that Andretti gets through it. As Andy said, the FIA and Formula One should have sorted this out way before they charged applicants $300,000 for the privilege of applying to walk into this shitstorm. This is not complicated. This is the problem with greed. Andretti has every right to expect to get into Formula One. You know, it doesn't matter about how competitive they are. I think what everyone needs to also appreciate is nobody, none of the new applicants, Andretti included, has ever built a Formula One car. So actually, it doesn't matter if you've got five other formulas that you race cars in. None of them have built a Formula One car. Andretti may still get onto the grid in 2025 or 2026 and be four seconds behind the rest. They might do a Ross Braun. We could end up being on the grid and and being a, a Ross Braun or, or, you know, struggling. But so it's not... For me, for us as a team, it's not. It wasn't ever about you know why should they choose us over them. The the short sightedness is they have no presence in Africa. If rumours are true, F1 have managed to drop the ball with the South African Grand Prix for now, and to not have a team at the moment. If you include Canada as the you know North American kind of continent, there are five races in America, and they've already got an American team. It's Haas. I personally think that F1 is riding on the coattails of the success that they've had with Drive to Survive, and that's helped propel them into this kind of almost a false economy of like, well, look how fucking great we are. One of the criteria of applying and one of the kind of focuses for Formula One was how are you going to expand this as a sport and grow it? I.e. grow the fans, grow the interest, grow the numbers, grow the eyes on the prize. Well, I think they're going to struggle to see a return on that by just putting through one team that's going to be based in the US eventually. And the last thing I'll say on that is Andretti is planning to do exactly what we were planning to do. We were going to have a temporary base in Europe whilst our facilities are being built in Asia. Andretti is going to do exactly the same whilst their facilities are going to be being built in America. They're going to have to go through the same process regardless. They may have got the license, but Lucky Sons is going fucking nowhere. Uh, we We are working very hard in the background on what we do next. The Americans can do it, but they can't do it over in Asia. I think that's, you know, that's a questionable decision. I just want to ask, you know, what's next? Is there an appeals process? Is there any chance you guys can, can still make it onto the grid for 26? What do you think we are looking at right now? Have a guess. Well, if you well, were in just... our shoes, Bex what would you do? I suspect there's probably an appeal. Can I come in there, guys? Here's what I think is going on on the ground. I I would bet my mortgage that there's an appeals process, but I I would bet that around that appeals process, you you guys need to exercise your safe word and say NDA quite loud, (laughs) because I don't think there's too much you can talk about that, because I'm guessing that it's it's an ongoing process, Stephen. Mm, Let's say it's not ongoing anymore. But in terms of what's next, there's a multitude of options. To put it crudely, we've got a bag full of cash and and we want to continue to do what Lucky Sons was set up to go and do. So you've got different options, okay? So you can go out and look at purchasing a currency. As James Bowles said the other week, and it was quite a strange term, you know, half the grid are quite lossy. We could look at reverse engineering, what we wanted to do with Lucky Sons. And so instead of setting up a Formula One team and then going, sort of um, creating pathways from grassroots to Formula One, we could start off at grassroots and work our way up to Formula One and wait the next sort of tender process to start for a new, for a new license. And I think everything's on the table. I mean, it doesn't it wouldn't take a, a rocket scientist to, to imagine what we are currently doing and what sort of plan B, plan C, plan D, plan E, plan F are all in motion at the moment. We're certainly not going to go and hide away now until we've sorted B, C, D, E or F. We're going to continue to sort of make sure that Lucky Suns is still out there. So, yeah, we, we just want to keep everything open and honest and, and as and when. You know, I think we'll be loud and proud about what we end up doing. I think I think what what's quite interesting, you know, uh, I think there was there was a, a quite a short, sharp snap process of grieving. We knew, I think, three weeks before the FIA had their arms twisted and had to announce but i think we kind of went through a a fairly quick well that's shit but you know what uh lucky sons was never just about formula one you know and it can't be you can't set up these kind of academies and educational programs with universities in all of these countries train these people up and then plonk them into a you know a pit crew at a formula one race you know it doesn't work like that Uh, but the only thing i'll say is this is a testament i think to the the work that andy paul and, and benjamin have managed to do since the FIA announced 
that it was only Andretti. We've had more interest from people that want to get involved than we did even before the announcement was made that they're opening up the books for new teams. And that should tell you that the people see the value in what we're trying to do and believe in what we're going to do. Uh, and so, you know, we um, we march onwards. And that, that interest isn't just people trying to throw more money at us. People from current teams, current motorsport teams, F1 and further down, sending their CVs in, they like what we do. It's all very similar. All the, all, all the messages are very similar. You know, the sport needs this. The sport needs lucky sons. Love what you're doing. Can you consider me further down the line and things like that? And that's that's quite. I'm not going to say I'm not a particularly emotional person, but that kind of does sort of make you think. You know, people do believe in what we're doing, and we're on the right track, and what we are doing, we're doing it with the best intention. And I, I also I think for people that didn't hear the quick stop F1 thing, you know, Benjamin again made a salient point. This wasn't a case of like, oh, we get the license and then fuck, we need to start employing some engineers. We have 380 people who are ready to jump ship and start working for Lucky Sons. Okay. We had this as a plan. Well, as soon as we got the license, we'd have had 100 people employed almost with immediate effect. This has been a long project that, you know, certainly Paul, Andy and Benjamin have committed an awful lot of time to. It's not the news we wanted, but you know what? Every underdog gets a sucker punch and that's all this is. It's how you get back up. We got up a long time ago. Just to legitimise what Steve just said there about the 380 personnel, we have a partner called VHR. VHR is a technical recruitment company, one of the biggest in the world, that placed over a thousand people to Formula One. They've been working with Benjamin since day one, okay? and so that, consequently they were working with Lucky Suns throughout this entire process as well. So it's not we're not just pulling numbers out of the air. You know, we were going to end up having 380 people working on building this car, and VHR were our partners in, in making sure that we were recruiting those people. You know, even for the senior management roles, I can hand on heart, I can say we probably had three people lined up for each position. Yeah, you know, and we're talking team principal point uh, role there as well. And I think, it, sorry, I know you probably got other questions, but why is it that the 10 teams are currently really fucking reluctant? Because it can't just be about money because we offered them 600 million it can't just be because they haven't got enough garages at Sandvor. why might it be potentially two new teams coming into formula one because they know the people that sit below adrian newey they're going to fucking jump ship you know engineers or technicians in in other teams are going to want to go and put their mark on a new team i understand that if i was one of the 10 teams i'd be shitting it thinking we're going to lose staff here and this comes back to the point about talent now we couldn't rock up with people that we've trained immediately in from asia or from africa but if Eventually, they're all a bit screwed. James Vowles even said two weeks ago, they struggle to employ people, certainly of diversity. They're all based in the same place. Well, we won't be. And that is a big risk for them, not for us. How will the academies work? Are you going to start off one in Asia, one in Africa? Like... How's that going to work? We've got partners who have been working with us across Asia that we've been working with in terms of what those initiatives and the structure of those academies look like. You know, this is not about drivers. Of course, we'll be looking for drivers. That's part of the academy. I think when people talk about motorsport academies, we all naturally immediately think of racing drivers. This is fundamentally about garnering interest in terms of the whole spectrum of, of the paddock. Think of all of the jobs and all of the people. That's what we want to bring to Formula One. This isn't just about finding data analysts and engineers and designers and uh, aero people it, it's a whole spectrum so it's hospitality it's it's management it's content creators and so Andy and I have got some ideas about in terms of working with the sponsors that we brought on board to work with us using hip-hop and music as, as one of the genres uh, working with all of those markets in Malaysia Indonesia Vietnam Thailand countries Zimbabwe Nigeria and Kenya and Ghana and Africa and actually having these activations where we go and host, you know, it could be at a go-kart track, be working with the local motorsport federations to actually start garnering interest, building a bit of Lucky Sun's awareness, first and foremost, because you can't just rock up into Kenya, despite the government backing and the support and the working with universities. What does that program look like? How is it run? Who runs it? You know, how do we, how do we find the students to put into those programs? because there will be countries and cities and communities that may have heard of Formula One, but don't have any interest in it. Why? Because they've never had the opportunity to even consider having a career in the motorsport industry. And as an industry, it covers many facets. This is, this is a very long-term investment into those countries and those continents to actually get that up and running. 
know that you guys are savvy enough as marketeers to to leverage the power and and the coolness that's embedded deep within hip hop culture. How do you ensure that in trying to leverage the power of hip hop, that Lucky Sons is more Eminem than it is Vanilla Ice? <laughs> Good question. Um, look, I think uh, th- th- there's always going to be that elephant in the room, and we have we've always been quite open and honest about that, right? But uh, how do we manage that? We have already uh, been talking to partners who are represent agencies that are diverse agencies, and I don't mean they've got a charter and they've ticked a few boxes. I've got links with various schools and universities in the UK and further afield who do great courses with regards to TV and media, but content creation now. So we actually go from day one and start working and getting that talent in to start working uh, with us rather than us trying to project an image of, you know, doing a colonialism. And uh, we like that. We'll take that and we'll pretend that we're a hip hop team. No, it's not about that. So when we're talking about hip hop as well, that migrates into the kind of the artists and the music and the musicians that we want to get into the fold and start working with, unsigned, uh, as yet unknown, or they might be signed to a smaller label in Malaysia, but we want to give them the platform to start working with us to create content that doesn't look or sound like any Formula One team. At some point, somebody somewhere has to do this. As awkward as, as it might be to have you know, three co-founders that are white. But as Benjamin said on that podcast, the fact that this is a question, it flags the problem. It shouldn't be an issue that that three people of white colour are trying to do something that is going to broaden the spectrum of diversity in the sport. It just so happens that we're the ones that's trying to drive it right now. I've said this on, I think, everything I've done publicly, and I'll say it on here. If we're doing our job properly, within five to ten years, somebody that doesn't look and sound like me should have my job. That's the fucking point of Lucky Sons. We want to go out there and find the talent. Guaranteed there will be 10 people who can do what I do and better that don't look or sound like me. We're trying to use, you know, all of our resources and and contacts to then start that work. And so, and hip hop is just a great kind of genre of music that spans way beyond music. It's an attitude. If you look at back in the Bronx in the 70s, when hip hop really started, it was created by people that didn't see an opportunity, but had the kind of creative idea, splitting music apart and putting it back together in a different breakbeat. You know, you have people, you know, expressing themselves in breakdancing. 50 years later, it's a global phenomenon. And why is that? Because it represents an attitude of, fuck it, I can do it. And if you look at how technology and the ability to access information, you have got, rightly so, kids in their bedrooms making fucking amazing music and fashion and content. And that's why we're here tonight, right? The, the reason why we wanted to work with you guys and the reason why Quick Stop F1 did that interview with us, we had offers from media outlets that wanted to do interviews with us. When the FIA made the announcement, we had a plan all along. A was we get the license, B we don't. Both plans had kind of the same output, which was we're gonna have a blackout on media. We're not gonna to respond to any journalists. We're gonna give our exclusive interview to Quick Stop F1. Why? Because they're making great content like you guys are. We want to be able to work with people that don't look and sound like the usual media outlets. We're doing this tonight because it's the it's the very first star of us actually being trill, right? Being truth and real about what we're doing and being as transparent as we can be. And that's how it's going to be applied across all the work we do. And it's about finding and nurturing talent that one day will replace me. But how do you guarantee the competitiveness? I'm not doubting the rest of it, but how do you jump on there and stick it up to the rest of them? Like we'd all love to see you doing, by the way. It's just there's so many factors. So are we, are we specifically talking about Andrew? No. No, I think Mark's question was basically, how do we how do we guarantee we're not uh, below the hundred, the old hundred and four percent rule? I shit. Yeah, rule. exactly. Yeah, that's a. I, I don't think anyone can guarantee that. But what I can say is, is that we were coming into the sport with a billion dollars, gets you a long way, which is more money than what any team has come into the sport with. And I think that billion dollars, as much as however much was going to be obviously paid as part of an anti-dilution payment. Um, it also enabled us to spend money in areas that current Formula One teams 
can't necessarily because of the capex um, and because we wouldn't fall under the regulation or we wouldn't fall under the, the Concord agreement until a year before our first season. Now, our, our first season, we want it to be 2026. So that means we would have up until or from, from now until the end of 2025 to make sure that our facilities are state of the art. Um, and that goes a long way because you, you know, you, you can listen to the current teams at the moment. You know, Williams wants to update his facilities, but he can't because of the capex. But we, you know, we we would be able to up until a point. And so that's, I have a good that's, idea. I have, I have actually a good idea for yourselves or Williams, Williams especially. Go for it. To should have robbed Bear Nichols' uh, tax <laughs> refund. <laughs> We should, guys, we should get James Vowles on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Rob Bernie Eccleston's tax refund of six hundred and forty million or whatever it was. So I think, yeah. So I think, I think money plays a big factor. The facilities that we can build with that money plays a big factor. And obviously, of course, the, the, the technical capabilities of those three hundred and eighty people that we were going to be having working on the team as well. Um, but at the end of the day, there's all, you know, there's, there's, there's ten, eleven, twelve teams on the grid. One of them. And at the moment, it tends to be the same teams that are finishing around about that position. Yeah, I don't, don't know what else to say to that. Well, I, I think, I think uh, thanks for the question mark or comment. Look, not nobody, nobody. This isn't this isn't just a money thing. This isn't a oh let's do something that's diverse and let's go and raise a load of money. Oh, and by the way, we've got to build a car. As I mentioned before, Benjamin, the CEO, whilst he won't be responsible for building and designing the car has won World Endurance Championships. He's homologated more cars and won more championships than Andretti. The people who are at the very top of this organization know what it takes to build a World Championship winning car. Not a Formula One car, but they know what it takes. In the same way that, you know, without blowing my own trumpet, I'm an award-winning creative director. That means fuck all. But you know what? I came on board because, you know, they, they needed someone like me and I knew Andy and when you when you see the caliber and the quality of the people that are in the background and then on top of that you've got a CEO who's been there seen it and done it uh, that, that to me I'm not I'm not saying Benjamin uh, I'm the same as Benjamin but I wouldn't necessarily bring in uh, a junior designer to be a creative director and agency in the same way that we're not going to go out there and bring in people that, that haven't had any experience of doing this um, so whilst throwing money at stuff helps, it is about quality and not quantity. Uh, but you're right, you know, we could we could turn up to Bahrain in 2026, uh, if that's where we do start, uh, and struggle. Uh, equally, uh, the, the opposite side of that coin you tossed, Mark, is uh, we could do a brawn in 2009 and fuck everyone out of the park. Unlikely, but not impossible. Um, somebody who I know has been wanting to ask a question for a while, uh, Clinton, absolute legend of the space you've seen. So uh, off you go, buddy. You're too kind, Baxty. So based off of what I see, language from Formula One principles, Formula One uh, management of teams based around uh, ethnicity, questions about people's genealogy, all kinds of weird stuff. What factor does Lucky Sons having operations based in Asia and Africa with junior racing programs that could draw heavily from Africa and Asia, would that sort of force would obviously change the look and some would say the feel of Formula One? Uh, you being a disruptor, a a medium for change how does having driver academies drawing from a pool of talent that isn't necessarily european white do you think that had any impact it's the question do you think our bid got rejected because of that yeah i so my theory is and again i'm not on the inside i'm an outsider looking in and i've kind of followed your guys since you know we kind of came into the public light and, you know, my feeling has been that Formula One doesn't really want diversity because if it did, then when someone questions someone's ethnic ethnicity being from Mexico and yeah. it goes unquestioned and unpunished, then it leads me to believe that a team like you that's a disruptor, that wants diversity, that wants change, 
that wants to bring a new look and feel to Formula One, that perhaps having a, a driver pool where you'd be potentially finding talent from Africa, from Asia, that that could change the balance. And perhaps that is a reason why. So, I mean, if you can't answer it, that's fine. But I just wanted to throw that out there. I know it's a long-winded question, <laughs> but I felt, it, I felt it was important to kind of give some context. Let me just clarify. The reason I was laughing is because I did interpret what your question was. And maybe my laugh is the answer. Did, did, you know, if, if the question was, do you think our bid, because of all of those factors, was denied because of it, and that's why I laughed. I'm not going to say whether it was because yes or Thank no. Thank you. That's I why I love. That. Thank you. Because I think personally, and this is from a fan's point of view, the stuff most recently with Checo was fucking disgusting. And for 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 the fallout of that, for the person involved who said it to be then kind of saying, "Oh, he doesn't work for the team. He's a uh, you know, uh, come the fuck on, man." Like you, you I think it, it treats the fans with a level of stupidity that I don't think they even realize themselves because they're in their own little bubble, right? And that's all I'll say. But um, maybe Andy should talk before I get myself in trouble. Uh, I, yeah, uh, no, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think I, I've got a pretty short answer to that one, to be honest. I think it would be pretty fucking sad if that was the case, Clinton, wouldn't mm. it? Yeah. Um, and in all honesty, I'm not sure I've got an answer whether it is the case or not. Um, I have my own thoughts and I'm probably better off not saying what my thoughts are just in case I get a slap from a, from a higher up somewhere. Yeah, I, I think to normalise this, yeah. Um, and I think it, obviously it does need to be normalised. I think the teams, they're quite big organisations. And it's difficult to turn those types of organisations around quickly. And like Steve suggested earlier, what are you going to do? You're going to you're going to fire everybody, everybody just and, and then rehire based on colour of the skin or or, or 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 whatever. You know that that's that then gets into the political realms, and I think that's a really dangerous place mm -hmm. to be. So I think teams would like to be able to do more than what they are, but I think their hands are tied behind the back. Um, at which point, point I think there's a there's a, there's a real case. For the sport as a whole to answer in terms of not allowing us to do what we wanted to do because it's, it's a real it's a real opportunity that's been fumbled um and i think we should have been given the chance to to do what we wanted to do not just based on <clears throat> on what we wanted you know on, on on the color of somebody's skin that we wanted to bring into the sport right or where they were based or or whatever just because it just made the whole fucking place a hell of a lot more fun because you just got different people doing different things clinton i hope you're wrong Mm, I do too. Uh, Andy is testament to this. When he and I first started talking about this, one of the very first things I said to him was, I want us to bring in the first female Formula One driver. I don't care where she's from, but if she's black, great. But wherever she's from, I want us to be that that team. That was our thinking from the get-go, right? The, uh, the irony, the irony of why there isn't a woman in, fem in Formula One is because it's almost impossible for them to earn enough super license points to qualify for a fucking super license. Who governs that? We know who governs it. There is no question in my mind that women, and uh, I know this because I'm married to a very strong independent woman, women are way more capable than men. So this question of, oh, are women capable of driving? Look at, what's it called? The Iron Maid team in, in WEC. They're fucking amazing. In fact, I think they put it on P2 for Pet, uh, Petit Le Mans in, in America. Women are way uh, as capable as men of driving a Formula One car. I'm absolutely sure of it. Jessica Watkins, she um, had a test with Aston Martin in Hungary, right? Uh, and if you, if you, I, I don't, I'm not a massive fan of Nico Rosberg, but I do like the fact that when he interviewed her on Sky Sports, in Qatar, he basically alluded to the fact that her lap times were fucking amazing. Uh, cheers, Clinton. Um, I've let a couple of speakers up. Um, we're going to go with Coconut, and then we're going to go with Rory. Cheers, back to you, Cameron. Uh, thanks for having, uh, having me on, and all of us on, actually. And Before anything, I just want to say big ups and lots of respect to you, Andy and Steve, for being as candid as you've been uh, during this entire thing. Honestly, mad respect for that because we don't often hear 
enough of you know the top brass speaking as candidly and as openly as you do so i definitely really value that i was actually texting back to you about this i have way too many questions <laughs> but i'm gonna try to narrow it down as much as i can i'll get my pen ready <laughs> no 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 no. because i'm gonna keep in mind that there are others on this piece as well but uh i'm gonna try and narrow it down as much as possible the one thing that i do want to say though is i picked out on you guys mentioning southeast asia a lot and mentioning malaysia a number of times so I'm currently based in North America, but I am from Malaysia. Hearing this has made me extremely excited to know what you have in mind, especially uh, with uh, in terms of what you intend to do grassroots wise. And I guess my question moving forward for the two of you is going to be based more on it, it's going to be a two pronged question. The first part is you've mentioned a lot about diversity and things like that right and I, I I mean Baxi and everyone who's been on the spaces know that I'm very vocal when it comes to diversity in the sport be it uh, ethnicity or gender and I've called out a lot of that so I want to know I get that Lucky Suns is promoting diversity throughout the sport and that's why you're breaking into Asia Southeast Asia and Africa but what are your personal inspiration the two of you and what drives you to do this and how would you ensure that this drive to ensure that we have diversity in F1 is echoed throughout your 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 sort of like brand and company and how do you intend to sustain it? And then the second part is I'm essentially from an educational psychology background, right? And you mentioned earlier about having plans in place about, you know, working on education and supporting uh, the grassroots and things like that. But what sort of plans and how much emphasis do you intend to give on mental health and the development of sports psychology for individuals from a young age through the academies all the way up into F1? And will you put the drivers first is going to be the main question as well. Uh, I think the first one is, is how do we just sustain it? Well, we sustain it by being based in a completely different continent, building a car, creating in, in, an entire team in a completely different continent. That's how we sustain it. So let's, we'll, we'll use Malaysia as, as an example. At some point, the team will be entirely operational out of Malaysia. And by doing that, you obviously naturally open up the door to bring in locals in to that environment, to that to that team environment, and obviously other places that surround Malaysia. Um, it just makes things a little bit more, a lot more accessible for those that typically don't have the ability to up sticks from Southeast Asia and, and move themselves to Fayenza or to or to Milton Keynes. And so I think, yeah, I, I think sustaining it actually happens um, very naturally. And on the other side, as regards to mental health, not sure I understood the question, to be honest. I think it's a really good point you've raised, Coconut. Uh, I will just say as well, I've worked in KL, lived over there for only for about six months, but uh, traveled to Borneo, worked in Phnom Penh for a bit in Cambodia for crazy projects. Uh, spent quite a lot of time in Bangkok. The decision to be based in Southeast Asia had nothing to do with the fact that I love that part of the world. But um, my son's actually a quarter Malaysian because his mum is half Malaysian. So I have roots, almost. I think the mental health thing is a really important question for every organisation. From my own experience and working with, with the team over the last year or so, uh, and having worked in some really toxic places, these academies, these facilities, will be to garner and nurture and find that talent, you know, and yes, prepare them for whatever grassroots pathways we provide for them. And that will come through a, a myriad of like esports and sims and competitions. But ultimately, it comes from the top down. And I've worked in enough places, that are, toxic is a word that gets overused, I think. But I know, having spent time with, you know, Andy and, and Benjamin and Paul, I wouldn't have committed the time and blood sweat and years into this if i thought for one second that these were a bunch of charlatans it comes from the top down and that that top down is a place of a point of view of passion and and giving a shit about making sure that people who have never had the opportunity are then made aware that there is an opportunity and that they can not only take it but end up having a career in motorsport or formula one sustainability is also about how you service your business in a local regional sustainable way which means being based in wherever it might be malaysia you then immediately start to grow that local economy because you will end up working with local suppliers and we will have the ability to sustain it both financially and by investing in those academies and facilities 
So it's not just about plonk a big new factory next to the Sepang race circuit, for example, and you employ 400 people and that swells up to 800 people. It's about all the businesses and local community supports that you then use and work with. So that's how you sustain it. The likes of Minardi and different teams that were at the back of the grid. A lot of those teams, even the caterums and, and the teams that came in like Marusha, they failed because there wasn't a cost cap and they didn't have the funding in the first place to even be able to compete with those kind of budgets that there were in, the, in those days. We have the funding. Uh, thanks, Coconut. Um, so we've got two more questions for you guys. The first is going to come from Rory and then it's going to come from Rainmaker and then we're gonna, we'll finish up with that. Thanks for Andy and Steve for uh, coming onto the space. It's just a general curiosity. I know you said you want to do a media blackout. You went and did your first exclusive interview with Quicksup F1, but how F1 is so dominated by conventional media in written and print and you have your Sky, your broadcasters. To get the brand out there, it, it kind of just seems like like Baxi Camera and Quicksup, they have a community, but it's not the size of F1. F1's reach, global reach and so on. Do you think you will need to do like a big media interview to actually get people uh, to actually know what's happening with with this uh, with lucky songs. Right, so I have this massive problem. I hate VIP areas. I hate red carpets. I hate roped off areas. If I when I when I go and watch a sport, I don't want to be in a box. I want to be in the GA area, mixing it with people that are there for the for the right reasons. Um, and I think that sort of goes some way in explaining our, our strategy in terms of, of speaking with the likes of Baxby, uh, Baxby and, and Cameron and, and the Quick Stop guys. This is that we just want to we want to be discussing Lucky Sons and talking about Lucky <clears throat> Sons with real fans who are essentially real people, just like Steve and I, just like Paul and Benjamin. Um, and, and if we can if we can elevate those people or these you know, these different platforms in the process, that's what we want to be doing because platforms are the ones that deserve the big audiences because they're not looking to keep relationships strong so they can get the next exclusive. They just want to be talking about the real things and the real things that matter in, in, in sports such as Formula One. And I think that's where our strategy comes from. We just want to elevate people whilst we're on the come up as well. I also have a deep distrust of mainstream media. I think, and if anything, the last two months have proven that most journalists, not all, there are some really good ones out there, but most of them are, they'll run their own agenda, whatever you say to them. However nice you are, however accommodating you are, you know, we even had one journalist who mocked me being really polite to him in an email in the fucking article. You're like, do you know what? Go fuck yourself. And, and so our our stance on choosing to go with Quick Stop F1 for that interview and not some of the other mainstream medias. Uh, and your question really was, you know, also about, you know, do we feel that we'll need to do a bigger thing? No. The logical answer is yes. You know, we've, we've seen the fallout of Rodin Carlin. He's been very vocal in mainstream press and that's okay. We've done those things as well. We've done interviews, mainly because in my head, most teams will go, the primary strategy is hit all the big guns, hit all the media channels and get as much as you can. I used to work with a client in North Carolina who, who ran a, a fairly reputable but small record label and artist management. And I'll never forget, he always said to me, I was like, oh, how are you going to grow the fan base for Avid Brothers? Who he manages and still manages. He was like, one fan at a time, Steve. He said in a much more beautiful, soft, North Carolinian kind of lilt. He was like, one fan at a time. And he genuinely fucking meant it. We don't have, right now, the budget or the patience to do any you know, big media push because right now we're not a news story. As far as the press are concerned, we didn't get the license. We're old fucking news, right? And that's okay, because we're busy in the background doing other things. But even when we do have our pathway forward and we know what we're doing. We've already got plans for how we're going to get our message out there and it doesn't involve the mainstream media. We will, we will, of course we'll talk to them, of course we'll give them stuff, but actually our focus is where can we embed ourselves where actual real people are and how can we get that message out? So I'll give you a really quick example. Andy and I, we went out about four or five months ago, Andy, and we were talking about lots of these ideas and I was like, fuck a website. Why do we need a website for? Um, you look at most teams' websites, they're all very much the same. And I was like, I was kind of joking, but also meant it which is why our website kind of looks the way it does, because we kind of don't need to worry about it right now. In terms of social media, we've got plans for how we're going to approach social media, because having spent my entire career having to fend off clients who want to be on Facebook or TikTok with no real purpose, 
I'm quite a cynic about social media. I use it, I'm on it now, but we've got some plans that are not gonna be your usual typical plans. So the example I was gonna give you was, I jokingly said to Andy, fuck it, let's just do our own mixtapes, but let's get them pressed onto vinyl and cassette tapes. And when we do our little activations in KL, for example, let's go and find the darkest, dingiest, best, sweaty fucking hip hop clubs. We'll get some volunteers to park up with 500 pressed vinyls of whatever it is we're doing with local artists and we'll give them out free. That's how we want to approach this. This is not going to be a stereotypical team. If Lucky Sun's the Formula One racing team, yeah, absolutely. There's going to be things we need to do. But off the track, that's where we're going to get really down and dirty. And intentionally so, because other teams wouldn't fucking dream doing it because they're too focused on which VIP or VVIP they're going to get in their garage, or which influencer. That's not us. Last question of the night is going to go to Rainmaker. How are you doing, my friend? Good, sir. How are you? Thanks for doing this. I think being able to highlight these other players and the restrictive nature of the sport is important. My thoughts are the, the, the Formula One group is being deliberate, and I think eventually, and the key word being eventually, the African continent, major will become important, an important growth opportunity for them. At, at least when 2.5 billion is no longer enough. But but I think you will hear clamorings of wanting a New York Grand Prix before you hear anything about the African continent. You know, <laughs> I, I don't know why yep. they would even consider that at this point in time. But m- my question is, would partnering with, with the African government or at least a sporting agency from the African government or, or in Asia hurt your opportunity in continuing the fight that you are waging here, given the fact that the Concord Agreement calls for 12 teams and there's still an opportunity out there to continue to push push forward. There's a quite a simple answer to that one, Rainmaker, and that is our bid um, was full of governmental support from various countries across Africa and Malaysia and, and, um, and Southeast Asia. So it was all, we already have support, governmental support, from many of the countries that we've already mentioned. But at the same time, as we are today, um, we are still building those relationships with those governments and starting new relationships with other governments um, of, of various countries across Southeast Asia and, and Africa too. We're, we're very well placed. We've got feet on the ground essentially that's what I'm trying to say they make already and whatever Lucky Suns looks like in the, in, the, in the coming months those governments will be part of the reason we'll be doing what we're, what we're doing because they're sort of clearing the pathway and supporting us in what we are doing 
a, a quick follow-up question then did did they give you some guidelines with regards to where because it would make sense then if they're saying no to you at least i think to give you some guidelines about you know where where they thought your your bid might be lacking and what could or should be done is that where um, we use a safe word <laughs> <laughs> you know what fuck the safe word they they did give us um a report um, we challenged it um, because we didn't agree with their report or, or, or any, any of the misunderstandings that we felt that they had done um, and they still came back and said no we stand by our decision it's as simple as that I'm afraid and and just before because I know I know it was Rory and Raymaker were supposed to be the last one to carry on the back three but I'm just I've, only, I've just found that there's a there's a sort of a messaging thing here and I've, there's a couple of questions that um, from some of your listeners that I think we should we should also answer go for it man if is, you're happy to do it go for it that, yeah absolutely yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here until nobody wants to answer any questions <laughs> I don't know about Steve or at least here until my earplugs run out of juice <laughs> <laughs> there's um there's, there's a listener called Seven Hanos Eight Seven Six, and uh, and they they ask how often can a prospective bidder reply, and and that has been made clear to us that there's no there's nothing stopping us from reapplying at some point whenever whenever that process is reopened. So it's sort of not done and dusted from that point of view. So if we're not if we're not in the sport by the time that probably the next Concord agreement is signed and in place, and and we're still out there doing our thing and still Steve's still making big noise for us. Um, if we wanted to, and we haven't already got a team, um, then then that's a that's a definite um, option for us. And uh, they also had a second question, which was name a biggie track. And <laughs> and I'm not I'm not sure my answer to that is going to go down particularly well. But it's mo money, mo problem. Um, <laughs> just for the fact that just for, I, I just love the video. Steve, have you got a favourite biggie track? Probably hypnotise. I don't know. I wasn't a massive biggie fan. Beep, <laughs> beep,